Hello and welcome to Business Television. Uh, we are here at the India Today BTTV studios in, at the World Economic Forum in Davos and with me two very special guests, Rajiv Mimani, the chairperson of EY India and Julie Teaglin. She's the EMEIA Area Managing Partner. That's Europe, Middle East, India and Africa. Very wide portfolio. Thank you very much. Uh, we are, uh, the, this year's event is winding down. And both of you have had occasion to talk to many business leaders, absorb and understand what's happening. The big headline that we started our coverage here was last summer, there was a lot of optimism in the air, Julie. And now there is what a lot of people are calling record levels of pessimism. Uh, what's your own uh, uh, view and outlook regarding the global economy and how business is going to shape up this year? Okay, so my view is it's very uneven. Saying that it's a record level of pessimism is simply too easy in a complex world. We see pockets of absolutely stunning growth. India is one. Middle East, for example. ASEAN is going to live bright spots. China, as they come out of the COVID crisis, I think you're going to see really take off and fly. And we're going to have pockets of difficult difficult spots where countries have not yet completed the transformation, where they're midway, not leveraging the power of emerging technologies or digital to keep their cost under control, and where inflation eats into demand. And be that inflation from energy prices, food prices, or the like, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. I think you'll see some of that in Europe. I think the U.S. will have pockets of sunshine as well. Wow. You'll see certain sectors explode. And I think companies are actually... They've proven that they've been navigating quite successfully the last years. Absolutely. Uh, you gave us some good points and, uh, you know, uh, business executives, especially uh, those uh, uh, at relatively uh, junior positions, have perhaps earned an MBA without paying for it in the last three years. <laughs> and so have uh, owners, promoters and CEOs. Rajiv, uh, the Indian perspective. Uh, somebody was just saying that uh, minus the Chinese, minus the Russians, and perhaps a lesser number of American companies here, it is India everywhere. Uh, is it because uh, everyone likes enjoying the cold <laughs> or is there, is there something else driving it? Yeah, I think uh, there are a couple of things. One is the Indian visibility on the promenade. So physically speaking, is, is very strong. You have three or four states who are pushing for investments. Obviously, you have India... Uh, uh, you know, as a country pushing for investment. So I think that, that way, I think in a, in a physical sense, it's there. But I would say in a real sense also, uh, as, as Julie was mentioning, India is being seen as one of the brightest spots in the world. And I think India has had great opportunities in the past also, but I think this is one of those times where the opportunity is fully baked and the resolve is equally strong. So I think where opportunity is equal to resolve, I think that's what, one is seeing. Uh, you know, one, if you look at one of the big global mega trends, it is around demographics. And I think what makes the Indian story very interesting is the demographics. And now people are much more confident that this, de this demographic is, a, is really a dividend, uh, given what's happening around the world. And also the, the, the skilled people, the talent and everything is very strong. The, and the underlying factors, I mean, the technology piece, everyone, everyone knows. Uh, I, I think where, um, uh, what's really coming out very strongly is this entire supply chain shift. I won't call it plus one with any country, but the supply chain shift uh, that's happening, I think that the manufacturing side of the story is really taking center space. Quick interjection. Will the supply chain continue now that China has decided that zero COVID was perhaps not that smart? Yeah, I think it will. I don't think it's, you know, I don't think, I think people genuinely want to de-risk uh, and and uh, they want, whether it's China, whether it's Europe, whether it's US, people just want to de-risk and have two or three locations where they have. And uh, and also the, the, the other fact is that, you know, India as a country also with PLI schemes, with the tax rates coming down, uh, with uh, the other investment uh, and initiatives and stability, uh, stability in tax policy that's there. Uh, 
Uh, I think it's becoming very attractive and the government is making very clear that if you see India as a big consuming market, then you have to manufacture in India. And once you manufacture in India on a competitive basis, then the ex ability to export is also great. So I would say that's and, and the story on, on the digital public goods and services, whether it's the UPI, the Aadhaar and the digital stack that's being built and how that's leading to growth of an inclusive India. I think that story is very fascinating. And to that's people. What, that's the story that's being told. Viewers, I must tell you that uh, Rajiv is a very brave man. He's holding a metal body gun mic of the India Today group <laughs> in, in temperatures that are closer to minus 12 degrees. So, compliments. <laughs> uh, uh, Julie, I'm uh, uh, coming back to you on this uh, supply chain shift. 25, 30 years back, the Indian economy, companies uh, and people benefited with this shift where what we call the BPO wave. Is the supply chain shift anything similar? I, I think it's similar. Is it going to be of the same scale? I actually think it'll be a bigger scale because it'll include manufacturing. Hmm. And when you do manufacturing, it's not just BPO, it includes the entire value chain and allows you to turn the tables from not only addressing the India market, but exporting wider across the border. And I do believe the supply chain changes that we're seeing now, the de-risking, the moving from linear risk models in supply chain to multi-dimensional models, those effects are permanent. We're not going to all shift everything back to China or to one single location. If, uh, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. If the BPO shift was on account of uh, lower unit economics or lower costs, uh, manufacturing isn't amenable to lower costs. Manufacturing, by its inherent sort of uh, word, means good quality as well and if you say the export markets are involved then even more so then what why would uh, people want to look at india as that destination in my view three reasons access to great natural resources highly skilled capital and a fantastic local market those three factors coming together give way to excellent outstanding environmental conditions which you've already highlighted stable tax regimes, the laws are there, investment incentives are there to entice, but let's face it, if the underlying economics aren't there, those enticements are short-lived. We believe in India, it's there to stay. Uh, Rajiv, supply chain shifts. I'll take just one example which a lot of people have understood. Um, uh, uh, no one knew about semiconductor chips, potato chips were in vogue, but the last year or two years have taught that to people because their phones became more expensive, their cars took longer to deliver even in India. Uh, a supply chain shift around semiconductors. India has been trying and talking about it for years now. You see light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the first time, uh, I think the, uh, the policy came out was uh, about a year back. And post that, I think the government has come out with the PLI schemes. They have taken feedback from people. Uh, there are now announcements being made. From what I understand, in the next few months, one or two other big announcements will be made. Uh, on on what the on what the you know further progress on the semiconductor side, but I think it is it is the speed at which it is going uh, is pretty strong. But these are very significant investment moves. And the other thing is, a lot of the big players are also busy s building semiconductor plants in different parts of the world. So it will take time to attract talent. Uh, what the right scheme is, what the right PLI scheme is, how do you build that out? But again, as I said the resolve of the government is very clear to make it happen. That's why I think this opportunity equal to resolve is a very important thing. And I, I must uh, inform you as you continue your answer that uh, just 24 hours ago, Anil Agarwal uh, told us uh, that the ground uh, sort of uh, ceremony, the first ceremony for the massive plant that he has envisaged is going to happen in just 30 days from now. So wow. please continue. Yeah. Yeah. I just wow. wanted to add that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and the on the on the supply chain shift, you know, in our view, the shift, the scale of this shift, could be around four to five trillion. Uh, and if India was to get, you know, fifteen to twenty percent of that, it's a big number. Over what period, Rajiv? I would say over a period of four five years. Yeah. Okay. Julie, you want to add to that point? No, I I fully agree with Rajiv. I think it's India stands to take a huge share of the value associated mm. with that shift, and we think the shift is permanent. Mm. I also want to. Uh, take a quick point to Rajiv and I'll come back to you. Uh, conversations that I've had with you 10 years back or 5 years back, tax, retrospective tax used to keep coming up. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm glad that I don't have to ask you that. Uh, but what does it mean for foreign investors? Because we touched on that point, but if yeah. you want to elaborate, how significant is this fact that uh, so far there haven't been any retrospective? No, I think we have a very stable tax regime. The tax rates are very moderate. Uh, so I don't think from a tax law and policy standpoint, and government actually has fixed some of the problems in the last 12 to 18 months. They've also went, gone out and solved the, you know, ensured that the settlement is done on all the retrospective tax issues. From that perspective, it's very positive. I still do think that on dispute resolution, we need to do much more work. I think on ease of doing business, we still have to do more work. It's getting better and better. But on tax disputes, uh, on enforcement of contracts overall, on general dispute resolution, I think that's one area. If we can speed up on that, I think that will make it even a more attractive destination. Just like a lot of infrastructure that is necessary, the railways as an example, generally speaking, does not uh, deliver corporate levels of margins and profitability, governments invest. Why I asked you this was that in, in India, a lot of the digital infrastructure, the India stack, has been developed and is being run and maintained by the government. But for private sector corporations, uh, whether there is profitability was the point. Uh, uh, yes, both of you, I think. No, you know, I, I would say the reason the government is also doing that is because they see economic impact. Their ROI is not necessarily mentioned just in fewer financial terms, but overall economic and social impact to society. If I look at corporations, I really feel the same calculation needs to be laid. It's not just the immediate short-term financial impact, but the longer ability to scale that technology within, within the business, going through all of its functions from end to end. And there I really challenge that you can't and, give me a no, calculation. And, and your perspective is very important because like I said at the start of the uh, conversation, your portfolio gives you a very, very wide sort of sample. Raji. No, so uh, Siddha, it's absolutely clear. I think the India stack, uh, gives a very good infrastructure over which you can accelerate the digital uh, movement. Mm -hmm. And I, I think in my view, uh, there is, I meet very few clients who have any questions on that. How much change they can absorb, uh, what are the things they have to do. I think this is absolutely front and center of every conversation and every not a distraction, not a distraction. ESG is not a distraction. No, this is a reality. No, this Digital is a reality. transformation is a, is a reality. And the only question I agree with, Rajiv, the only question is the velocity at which you can take the change. How much change can you absolve with your people, with your infrastructure, at what speed you do it, but that you have to do it? This is effective life, See, I'm in, afraid. India will be a trillion dollar digital economy by 2025. See, I mean, if that's the shift that's happening, then organizations have to be ready and the efficiencies that come with that are, are phenomenal. Okay. As we wind down this conversation, uh, a question to both of you. Uh, what's your own p uh, personal sort of uh, thing that you're looking forward to in terms of new technology or breakthroughs that you're expecting will happen in 2023 and will drive fundamental change? I had someone here who mentioned chat GPT, a very obvious kind of answer, but your personal choice. My personal choice, um, and Rajiv and I were talking about this earlier, I'm going to go to a place where India is already leading the way on digital identity across the, across the space, leveraging the power of blockchain. I think it'll fundamentally democratize banking and financial inclusion across the world. I think chat GPT in my view, and, and the, the, the core of that is the artificial AI platforms. So basically organizations who can build platforms where you can ingest data from 20, 30, 40 different places, process that data and enable decision making. I think that's what is really going to change the quality of output that organizations get and how they, how they become more optimal and more efficient in their business. And this is a journey. This is not, there's no arrival point. How is chat GPT going to uh, impact your business? Well, hopefully we're going to leverage our own data and insights and benchmarks, our EY data fabric to harness the power of that. Okay. Uh, so I think next time when we have a uh, chat GPT, we, when I come for an interview with you, mm -hmm. I'll go to chat GPT and say that these are the, you know, if Siddharth is going to do an interview, what are the five questions that he's going to ask? <laughs> and hopefully it will give me the right questions. <laughs> It'll be <laughs> that's predictive. A <laughs> that's, uh, that's a tough one. But uh, Rajiv, uh, what I'm going to sort of block your time for is 
is the budget and uh, and the conversations around that because uh, in just uh, less than two weeks from now oh, we will have another big uh, event uh, thankfully in much better weather yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, in Delhi Rajiv Memani Julie Tegling thank you very much for your time with that it's a wrap on this conversation if you've been thank you very much thank you very much thank you